Thank you. Hi, everyone. So there's an interesting question here on Earth, or a statement, right, that all low roads lead to Rome. And at one point, it was true. About 100 AD, at the height of the Roman Empire, they had 2,000 miles of roads. And in one way or another, they really did all lead to Rome. But things have changed a lot since then. We have the airplane, which has made our world so much smaller. So even though we still rely on roads for our critical infrastructure, we rely on airplanes to bring our communities closer together. We rely on airplanes to bring economic opportunities to communities and, and uh, villages more rural than we could ever imagine. But even more, there's one more exciting avenue, and that is space. Space is truly the golden avenue to a future of prosperity for all of humanity. So you're looking at me and you're saying, space, really? Like Star Wars and Luke, I am your father and Final Frontier and all that? Absolutely. In the next 12 minutes, I am going to change your perception of space. I'm gonna share with you my passion for space and I hopefully will get you to embrace the fact that space is an integral part of humanity's future and our success. So the first thing, I'm a space lawyer, the first thing I always think about are definitions. When you think of space, what do you think? So it's called outer space, right? So everyone thinks it's out there, it's far away, it's beyond. Why do we even think about it? It has nothing to do with what we do every day, right? You couldn't be more wrong. Look at this map. We are in space. We live in space. Earth doesn't exist in some little bubble outside the universe or separate from it somehow. No, we are part of it. We are a part of the cosmos. And the sooner we embrace that fact and recognize that fact, the sooner we embrace our future. So we already use so much from space. There are satellites up there that help us do everything from pump gas, finish financial transactions, uh, get to the next Starbucks, upload selfies, watch news highlights, watch the, the last video highlights from the last Ole Miss win. Everything you do today likely involves a satellite. But it's even more than that, because industry is reliant on satellites. We use Earth observation satellites. We get data from space that helps us decide where we should plant our crops. Is the soil nutritious? You know, can we plant here? Should we plant there? We use satellites to tell us what the weather's going to be, right? We know there's a tornado warning because of a satellite. And we use satellites to help us do things like uh, track human traffickers and, and drug smugglers so that we can apprehend them and make our communities safer and help our neighbors. And of course, we also use satellites to do things like track military movements on borders. But space is also integrated into our society. We receive so many benefits from space that we don't even think about. Think about like NASA visors. Astronauts go to space. There's a lot of particles in space. It's not just like this empty vacuum tube. There's a lot of very uh, dusty, sharp particles. So NASA said, well, what are we gonna do? And they came up with scratch-resistant lenses. Scratch-resistant lenses, which our optical industry on Earth now uses to make glasses for you and me that are 10 times more scratch-resistant than they used to be. What about thermometers? NASA wanted to measure the, the heat that stars give off. You can't just pop a thermometer in a star, right? So NASA developed an infrared thermometer. I'm sure you've seen them. Parents embrace them because it's a lot easier to check the temperature of a two-year-old baby with one of these than with an old mercury stick. And of course, these thermometers were instrumental in helping us manage this pandemic. What about water? There's not a lot of water in space. You don't see astronauts carrying canteens with them. You know, you know what they do? They recycle their own water. Yep, astronauts drink their own pee. But it's okay, because NASA created a system, a process by which they can decontaminate that water. They remove the contaminants so it's safe to drink. We use that technology on Earth all the time to cleanse our water. You probably even use it on your tap to make your water just taste better. And finally, think about astronauts when they land back on Earth, right? That's a hard landing. And so NASA thought, oh, well, maybe we can make it a little bit more cushy for them. So they came up with a material that actually evenly distributes and, and the shock and absorbs that shock. It compresses, and after you compress it, it bounces back. 
You probably recognize this perhaps as a memory foam mattress that you might sleep on at night. And it goes on and on. Pacemakers, smoke detectors, grooves in roads. There are so many things that we have learned to make, use to make our lives better on Earth because of what we needed to do in space. But it goes on even more. There are companies right now that are looking to clean our climate, not observe our climate, actually clean it up. They want to move heavy industry off Earth. They want to take uh, servers and move them into space so they don't generate that heat into our atmosphere. They want to mine asteroids for those rare Earth metals we need to power our phones and our electric cars. There's even companies that want to take the solar power, take sun power, put solar pa panels on orbit, and then beam electricity down to Earth. Think about that. Beam it down to Earth on laser beams. Sounds crazy, right? Sounds impossible, right? Well, think about 1400. There was a time when all humans thought the Earth was flat. Think about that. When Christopher Columbus went to see King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, and he said, hey, I need you to fund me because I'm going to find a new avenue to the West Indies. There is not one person who is living on Earth at that point in time who looked at Christopher Columbus and said, hey, I bet I know what's going to happen. You're going to discover a world that's going to become United States, which is going to become the leader of the free world. Not one person in 1400 could have thought that. Not one person in 1400 could have thought that Christopher Columbus was going to bump into a land which brought us McDonald's and cheese, apple pie, and baseball, and jazz, and Elvis, and the Apollo program. Think about living in the 1400s and thinking the Earth was flat. And then one day, waking up and being told and realizing, no, 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 the world is round. That's where we are today. We are sitting in the old world, and we're looking at this new world beyond our orbits a world that we have no idea what it contains. We do know a couple things about this new world. We know that it, certainly in our vicinity, in our neighborhood, there's not a lot of, uh, a, a lot of other life. So we know that we're not going to be displacing people when we start exploring. And we also know that the universe is pretty infinite. So we have a lot of space. We have a lot of space to explore. We have a lot of space to share. Think about it. What is even more exciting than that is that we don't know what's out there. We have no idea what the universe holds for us. Will we find the cure for cancer? Will we find an element that allows us to build cars and other vehicles more safely, lighter, faster? Will we find an element that will allow us to heat our homes without any pollution whatsoever? Will we find the next penicillin? Will we find the cure for COVID? It's all out there, we just have to go and find it. And we're right on the cusp of doing all of this. There are private companies right now that are building space stations, they're building space hotels, they're building space corporate housing for film production companies. There are companies that are already shuttling tourists into orbit so they can look back on Earth and wonder at it. Now that's a lot more than my annual salary to take one of those trips, right? But let me tell you something. I'm sure there's nobody in the room here who was old enough to remember the dawn of air travel. But you know, when air travel first started, they didn't have budget airlines letting you get to, from uh, Memphis to Heathrow for 30 bucks. It was really, really expensive when flying first started. And only the really, really rich people could do it. And only the really, really rich people who did it, did it for the novelty. They didn't do it to get to a business meeting. They did it just to go up in the air and come down. Sound familiar? Now fast forward 100 years and look what the aviation industry has done for us. It is the backbone of our global economy. And it helped immeasurably throughout the COVID pandemic, helping us deliver medicines to people in need. This is where we stand right now on the cusp with space. But before we embrace all that space has to offer us, we have to think about our history. We don't want to forsake our history. 52 years ago, we did something amazing. We sent three of our own past our orbit. We put two humans on the moon, and then we brought all three of them back safely to Earth. Humanity's most amazing technological achievement, period, 
ever. But it was so much more than that. It was the audacious response to a challenge by a young president in the time of a Cold War. Think about that. This was 1969. The last time humans stepped on the moon was in 1972, 50 years ago. Let me repeat that. The last time humans were on the moon was 50 years ago. We had no business being on the moon in 1969. We had no business being on the moon in 1972. That was a technological achievement that was incredible and remains incredible to this day. But it's more than that. It also brought the world together. 650 million people watched Neil Armstrong put that first boot print on the moon. 650 million people huddled around black and white TVs in living rooms, on street corners, in squares, shared this experience of watching one of our own set foot on another celestial body. It was an incredibly spiritual movement which built kinship amongst all of us. Neil and Buzz knew that too. When they went to the moon, they took with them and left there messages of peace from 74 nations that are etched on a disc about the size of a half dollar. They took with them a gold olive branch, a message of peace. They took with them a patch with the names of Gus Grissom, Roger Chafee, and Ed White, Americans who perished in our, in our hope to reach the stars. But they also brought with them medals which commemorated Russian cosmonauts, Vladimir Komarov and Yuri Gagarin, who also perished in humanity's quest to reach the stars. Because you know what? You know what Neil and Buzz knew? They knew that they were going to the moon not just on behalf of all humanity, they were going as a result of all humanity. We don't get to the moon without three million years of human history. Three million years ago, one of our common ancestors stood up on two feet. We don't really know why. I like to think it's because it was somebody, you know, a parent running after some rambunctious and giggling child, right? We don't know why, but what did that do? What is so amazing about standing up on two feet? It freed up our hands. It freed up our hands to do things, like carry things, to make tools, to use those tools, to draw, to write, to communicate. We don't get to the moon without all of those abilities. We don't get to the moon without one of our common ancestors in the Congo picking up a baboon bone and drawing hash marks on it, starting our rudimentary understanding of mathematics. We don't get to the moon without our common ancestor, probably in Mesopotamia, picking up grains of sand and thinking, oh, if I heat this up, it'll turn into glass. We don't get to the moon without hundreds and thousands of astronomers and scientists and engineers and dreamers who helped us understand our place in the cosmos. Why should we care about a boot print on the moon? Because it reminds us of where we came from, what we have become, and what we can be, and that we need each other to achieve the impossible. That footprint is in Laitoli, Tanzania, and it's protected under the World Heritage Convention. 193 nations around this world agreed, every single nation on earth agreed that it's important to protect our cultural heritage because it is universal. These are things of universal value. These are things that draw humans together. These are things that remind us of our kinship. That step in Laitoli, Tanzania belongs to all of us. Sadly, that boot print on the moon is not protected in the same way. Anybody could go up to the moon right now and erase it, any robot can erase it. And there's a lot of missions going back to the moon right now in 2022. It can be erased with impunity, and that's tragic. Why? Because that boot print also belongs to all of us. It recognizes an achievement that was built on the backs of all of humanity. There's one more thing about space. Space offers an avenue to peace. We need to think about kinship when we go to space. We know we can't do the impossible unless we do it together. As we look out to space and think of all of the wonderful possibilities, we're not on a starting line. We are dwarves standing on the shoulders of giants. The least we can do is protect their boot prints. Last week, I challenged the United Nations to form a convention to protect our cultural heritage in outer space. Today, I challenge you to join me on this avenue 
this walk through history to a future that will only be bound by our own hesitancy. Thank you.